Hello and welcome to Podiatry Practice Mastery. Uh, my name is Don Pelto and I have Mr. Jason Kraus here. Welcome, Jason. Uh, nice to be here, Don. Great to nice, see you again. Nice to see you again. So we were recently together at the AAPPM meeting and we were catching up and we're going to be talking a little bit about your interest in orthotics and then your passion for practice management. So most of the people listening, everyone does orthotics and everyone probably has an orthotic company. Uh, and so the, the goal isn't for people to switch over, but it's to learn how they can maybe do more orthotics and make them more part of their, their treatment plan and, and doing AFOs and things like that. So tell me, tell us a little bit about, you have a long background. So give me a, a two to three minute synopsis of your background, how you got experience and, and things like that. Sure. Uh, I have been involved in podiatry, actually going all the way back to 1979, when I uh, got my first job uh, out of college with the Langer Biomechanics Group and Dr. Sheldon Langer, uh, who really mentored me both on the, the you know, subjects of biomechanics, uh, orthotics, uh, and all of that. But at the same time, he was a very skilled business professional, and uh, he was in clinical practice prior to opening up Langer. And uh, he used to, it, it wasn't called practice management back then, didn't have a fancy title, but it, it certainly was, uh, you know, very, uh, he was very involved in trying to improve the performance of his practice financially and used to counsel customers all the time. So I, I was a fly in the wall, wall early on, sponged a lot of information, got some good technical training. Uh, and I spent a dozen years there. I left in 1991. I started my own orthotic company, partnering with Dr. Langer, uh, called uh, Benefoot. Uh, so, ran that for about a dozen years, sold it, and got 100% uh, involved in practice management consulting uh, for about six or eight years. And uh, eventually, in uh, late 2000s, 2008, uh, I was approached by a private equity fund to partner up with them and create what became OHI, which owned Langer, the orthotic group, Apex Foot Health Industries, Arizona AFO, Petaline, uh, Diabetic Sock Company, a whole you know portfolio of lower extremity companies. Ran that uh, through 2019, left and uh, about uh, 18 months ago, started thinking about doing another uh, orthotic company that really combined my two great passions of practice management uh, and orthotics and tried to build a kind of a unique orthotic company that tapped into both of those skill sets. Wow, that's uh, that's quite a, a history. Uh, let's let's talk a, a little bit about we're going to kind of dumb this down because i really liked when you were talking with dr langer about the practice management side of orthotics so let's keep it real simple like what are some of the mistakes and reasons why doctors don't do more orthotics in their private practice something real simple yeah it's it's a myriad of different things sometimes it's just really just organizational structure they're not set up to be able to execute at a significant uh volume just because of the way uh their treatment rooms are set up or their staffing levels and so forth uh, as you know you know orthotics uh those patients uh, usually need to come back a number of times. They sometimes tie up treatment rooms, depending on casting methodology and so forth. So some practices are just structurally not uh, aligned with that particular component of practice. I think more often, though, what it really is, is just understanding uh, the patient population that could be uh, really helped therapeutically through the use of these modalities. Uh, a good, compelling patient presentation to explain how orthotics is a conservative intervention with the chief complaint that they present with, uh, and being able to, you know, select uh, appropriate candidates and and present effectively. Uh, insurance reimbursement is certainly a, a factor as well. Uh, some practices are quite skilled in in presenting orthotics without regard to the financial uh, component of it, uh, whether a patient has insurance or is a cash paying patient, the presentations are uh, equally strong and compelling because 
that's good medicine. Uh, other practices struggle with that. They, they do pretty well when there's reimbursement. They shy away from this expensive intervention for a cash paying patient. And again, some of that just good, good presentation skills may be lacking. Now, Jason, um, let's talk specifically, how can a doctor, and maybe I'm just talking about, you're thinking about your company. Yep. If I was going to, if I, I am a doctor, so I present all day about orthotics. Um, I always joke, if it's free, it's, it's easy to sell anything. Okay. Yeah. In Massachusetts, nothing's covered in terms of orthotics. So everyone has to buy it. So you have to be much better at presenting things. How can a doctor get better at presenting and how can they get more confident about learning? I've looked around. There's not really many great, I've asked people and I'm asking you, like I've asked some other companies that I use. I'm like, Hey guys, put some online training or training for us to learn, to be more confident about even prescribing them and, and using them. And, and because I think the more confident we are as doctors that these things actually work, the more confident you're going to be to offer them. Is it that because there's not much biomechanics going on these days for us to learn more? Yeah, I, I think that it, you, you hit the nail right on the head there. I, I think the overall educational underpinning of, of podiatry has changed over my 40 years. When I got started, biomechanics was quite frankly all the rage. It was uh, a fairly new science that had been organized uh, and presented and began to be taught in the schools. And, you know, some of the things to come later on, uh, surgical skills, uh, wound care skills, they, they really weren't at the forefront of podiatry. And the orthopedic management of these patients uh, was really what was uh, the cutting edge um, uh, work that was done in podiatry practices and well supported both in Pediatric colleges and residency programs today, you know, there's there's a great focus on surgical interventions. Uh, the surgical residencies are are really, you know, the ones that uh, folks are chasing after, and they need to be uh, go through that in order to get all their certifications to get on insurance panels. And so they really come into clinical practice with, uh, I think, uh, a fairly uh, limited. Uh, skill set with regard to how to use orthotics effectively, how to manage orthopedic patients more broadly. And I think along with that comes this confidence uh, factor that you described that comes across the patients. If, if you don't really understand its value, you're not going to be able to present that effectively to patients. Uh, and I think that does limit the, uh, the number of prescriptions that you'll see in certain podiatric uh, environments. Yeah. And, and so what most of us end up doing, this is what I had to do. I had to go shadow doctors and you yeah. hope that they're good at doing DME and AFOs and orthotics and you learn their spiel. And, and that's about it. Is there any other tips that you have? Like, do you guys have stuff on your website where people can learn how to explain it better or teach it better or you do it better? I don't know. Is there, are there courses that you know of? Like, why don't you put a course on it? I'll go to it. But yeah. Right. Well, uh, that's a good idea. I'm going to put that on my to-do list. Uh, you know, I have uh, lectured extensively, uh, as have others, uh, about this very subject. Uh, we've done workshops and role-playing and <clears throat> those types of things are, I think, quite effective because there's a lot of uh, skills, not only in, in presenting orthotics, but broadly uh, influential communications and, and you know, how to do that, uh, no matter what the modality or intervention that you're recommending to a patient, uh, there's verbal cues, there's nonverbal cues, like there's a lot of things that could be learned, I think, to enhance presentation skills, specifically when it comes to foot orthotics. Um, I, I really think uh, there there are great analogies that are frequently used to great uh, to great success that uh, patients can take a fairly complicated uh, technical product or service like foot orthotics, but be able to relate it to things mm -hmm. like eyeglasses or you know yep. wheel alignments for cars and um, you know I, I think the broad understanding about orthotics in the public sphere today is much greater than it was earlier on in my career, when I used to tell people I was in the orthotics business, I would get blank stares. Now, now everyone pretty much has heard of orthotics. They may not understand exactly what they are, but I think uh, it should actually be easier to present today than it might've been 20 years ago. 
Um, how to do that effectively uh, is uh, really built on your belief and confidence yeah. that it's the best thing for your patient. And when I do coaching on this, uh, Don, uh, you know, I really speak to this from that perspective. You know, if you present something to a patient that you would recommend to your mother, uh, it's going to come across that way. Uh, this is what I would do for my own mother. And, and you know, you want to give your patients exactly the, the, the exact same best service or best care that you would provide a family member. And, and that's just built on a belief system. I think where people trip over themselves is justifying the fee uh, and how to manage the presentation of the fee. I've seen Lots of different approaches to this. I've seen doctors basically bail out altogether. And do, and when I say bail out, I'm not being judgmental, but um, they, they prefer to have their staff discuss fees with patients and they don't they don't feel it's their place to do so. I've seen other doctors um, approach that in a in a very steady, uh, seamless way. Uh, to get patients comfortable with the fact that yeah, this does this is a, a, a fairly expensive solution if you don't have um, insurance coverage, but in the long term, th there's there's great value, uh, and certainly it's a conservative intervention that might prevent us the need for surgery. So, what, what, one of the things I've told doctors over many decades now is. Be the doctor, don't be the banker, right? Don't don't worry so much about your uh, your patient's ability to pay for what you think is best for them. Just present what's best for them, and if truly they can't afford it, you know that that they will let you know that. But your job really is to present the, the best solution. If you happen to think custom foot orthotics is that best solution, present it without you know fear of uh, rejection. Uh, because it comes across and, and it becomes a very wishy-washy presentation when you're dancing on the head of that particular pin. You, you know, what I, what I find is working now for me is I, I tell my patients, well, patients, I, as I tell the patient, my patients usually have three questions. They ask, uh, how long do they last? I say they usually last five to 10 years. How long do they take to make? They, uh, they take three to four weeks to make. And how much do they cost? They cost $550 and your insurance doesn't cover it. And I, I find by kind of pre pre going over some of the questions that people have, you could even include, you know, what's the biggest concern? Well, that over the counter are the same and really they're not the same. This is and this is the reason. So if you can pre tell the, the we call they call the objections or the questions that they have, I find that's the easiest way of doing it. And then it really kind of deflates everything, those main questions that they have. And I do it with my presentations that I've told you about that make it a lot easier for me, but you could do it just as easily talking. I think the key is though having a systematic method of when you present it to your patient. Like yeah. what are the circumstances systematically when you do it? Yeah, in sales, we call that objection handling. Uh, you, you're out ahead of those objections because you know those are you know potential pain points for a patient or you know reasons for them to uh, to decline to move forward and so yeah anticipating them addressing them up front uh, really disarms a patient uh, i think it also presents you as an empathetic uh, partner in their care you know that you know it's it's not uh, it's not inexpensive but with a 5 to 10 year lifespan and uh, and the fact that the success rate is, you know, in the high 90 percent, uh, I think it gives patients a high, high level of confidence. Yeah, I like that. You know, I, I, that, I, I haven't included that, but I'm going to start the 90 percent. Like I, I what I, maybe I return one or two a year, you know, and how right. many do I do? So I, I get more, more than 90 percent for Shockwave. I use something similar. I say Shockwave, it makes you get better 50 percent faster. And it has about an 80% success rate. I think people like hearing stuff like, like making that part of your spiel, I think really helps. I, let me give you two very quick stories that I think speak to this. One is a very early Dr. Langer story that I used to talk about in my lectures. Uh, when, when he was in practice, uh, orthotic fees might have been $150, $200. There was no reimbursement at all, not only for orthotics, but for podiatry more broadly. And when he would present an orthotic uh, case to an appropriate patient, and he would tell the patient, he would discuss the fees, it's $200. But these are custom made for your feet and talk about all the benefits. And once in a while, you know, a patient would object to the, the, the cost of that. That's a, you know, it's a, it's a lot of money. 
And his response was somewhat unique. I'm not sure too many people would have the, uh, the guts or confidence to respond this way, but he would say something to the effect of, I, I do understand that $200 is a lot of money. And, and you know, I've commi committed myself that if the, somebody really needs orthotics and they truly cannot afford to pay for them, I will provide them to them uh, as part of my pro bono work. And when he told me that story, I looked at him like he had two heads. It's, that's crazy. He goes, ask me how many times somebody took me up on a free orthotic, which I did. And his answer was zero. And when we started talking more about how that dynamic worked, he said this to me. He said, listen, people aren't looking for charity. They're looking for confidence. And, and they really wanted the confidence to know that this investment that they were going to make was going to make them better. And uh, they never took me, the, no one was really asking for a charitable contribution. They had not yet been convinced that the value that I was charging them was going to be delivered by the product. Uh, and no one ever took a month upon it. I'll tell you another story. This was a practice management consulting uh, client of mine, probably mid 2000s, <clears throat> a very busy practice, four doctors. Uh, I forget the number of patient visits a year, but something around 100,000 between the four doctors. Um, it was a, a, a border uh, city along the Mexican border. So a lot of the patients were uh, um, uh, immigrants that came across every day and went back and so forth. So that was the environment. And when I looked at the practice data, I saw there were prefab orthotics prescribed probably six to one, seven to one versus custom, which is not usual. And I, I asked this doctor, I said, the, the head doctor in the, in the clinic said, why all the prefabs? Well, you don't know my patients. You know, they, they just can't afford the custom and they don't have insurance. I said, huh, oh, that's interesting. I said, take a walk with me. So we walked out into the reception room. It was packed. It had to be about 30 people. And I asked the doctor, I said, just look around the reception room. Okay, uh, let's go out to the parking lot let's look around the parking lot and then we'll come back and we'll and we'll talk and i asked him i said what did you see when you looked around that reception room he goes i saw a bunch of people who were pretty upset that i was wasting time and they were waiting for their appointment i said he goes what did you see and i said well i saw a whole bunch of people on iphones i saw a whole bunch of people wearing 150 dollars sneakers I saw a whole bunch of cars in the parking lot that one or two years old. I said, really what's going on here is that your patients are deciding for themselves what they want to spend money on. It's not that they, you know, they don't, they, they may be, you know, factory workers or, or low income, but they still have enough disposable income to do the things that they think are most important in their life. Your job is to present what you think is the best solution, not to give them the cheapest solution. And if they they don't want it, that's fine. You've done your job, as opposed to sort of taking away the option from them to say yes. So, you know, those are just kind of techniques that, you know, I think make you a better doctor. And I think it really does convey um, a strong sense of confidence in your patients that, yeah, I understand this is a lot of money, but this is also the thing that will make your feet better. That's, those are great. Those are really, really good. I love the idea of, and because I, I, we do, I think all of us do, we care. So if someone really can't afford it first to that, we would, we would give it for free or if they don't work, like if they're real pain in the butt, what do you do? You refund them. you like, so if you have that guarantee, you should, you should like guaranteeing things it really will increase the amount that you do it. We're like, what happens if it doesn't work? Well, we'll, we'll refund you, you know, but there's a 99% success rate. But like who, who of us, if you send it back two or three times and it doesn't work, it's too hard, this and that, you refund it because there's such, there's such a pain in the, you know what, that you, you, don't, you don't want them bad mouth and you'd rather give it, you'll know, keep it and, you know, it's free. That's what I do. Yeah, well, you bring up a, another, it remind me of another story. I, another one of my accounts over the years called me up and asked that very question. What is the industry success rate for foot orthotic therapy? And there, at that time, there was a trade association for orthotic companies. And um, 
you know, our our number was about 5% uh, failure rate, so 95% success rate. I asked him, so why are you asking that? He, go, he, he was making the exact same point you make. He goes, I am thinking of offering uh, an unconditional guarantee of satisfaction for orthotics. And again, I was taken aback by it because it was a, a bit of a unique idea at the time. And he said, I just think I could double my volume. Just by doing that one thing, I asked him, I said, well, at that, this is probably going back 15 years ago. What are your fees? And his fees were about $500. And this was a, a Houston-based practice. It was a, a you know, middle-income uh, socioeconomic area. And so it's a lot of money at that time. And I, I kind of picked at it a little bit more. So why do you think you could double... Um, you double your volume with the guarantee. And his answer, I think, was pretty insightful. He said, it's not that they can't rustle up the $500. Their fear is that they do spend that money and it doesn't work. So if I remove that financial fear, uh, they will find the money. And I know it works 95% of the time. I feel like I'm being a really good doctor that way. Uh, and, and he was right. He doubled his orthotic volume. And, and, and frankly, we would do, I don't know, I do, I don't know if the other people do, but it's one of those, you, you know how much bad press you're going to have if, if they're stuck with something that they really don't like and use and it's just goodwill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and today, it even, you know, it's an even more important part of practice is maintaining the reputation. Back then, there wasn't, uh, you know, Google reviews or Yelp reviews to, to, you know, expose your policies. This was just, you know, he felt like, I know this is good for them. I know that they could gather the money if they had to, or if they really felt it was the right thing. But they, if I remove the risk of financial failure, yep. as well as therapeutic failure, it's, they'll make it work and I'll make it work. That's awesome, Jason. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk a little bit. I know we were talking a little bit about your company. I know you guys do 3D scanning. You do um, get a little dashboard, which I think is kind of cool, where they can look at where the orthotic is in the process. Um, and you have some AFOs as well. Um, now you guys are are doing the the balance brace as well through through your company. Tell me a little bit about this relaunch of the of the balance brace. Sure. Um, well, uh, I think you might remember uh, Dr. Jonathan Moore uh, really was out ahead in the profession of podiatry in terms of helping patients that were either at a high risk of fall or had a history of falls uh, just because of his practice. He just was practicing in an area that had a lot of elderly people. Uh, and, you know, I think as an intellectually curious uh, caregiver, he started studying uh, falls and, and the mechanics of falls. And uh, there, there's quite a bit in physical therapy. His wife uh, was an occupational mm. therapist uh, who was certified in uh, falls management. So he was exposed to it in terms of the patients that came in. And he was also uh, really a, a, a very curious about what he could do as a podiatrist to potentially uh, mitigate some of that risk. And that led over the early 2000s to the development of a custom molded AFO that originally was developed not necessarily as a commercial um, uh, situation, but just to be able to treat his own patients with. And what he found uh, after a, a number of design iterations was that, in fact, he was able to really stabilize patients that had postural, uh, significant postural sway problems. Uh, uh, really, fear of falling is another risk factor that people who were wearing the brace uh, were a, a lot more confident and their strides were uh, uh, longer and faster, which are also risk factors for fall. So he was able to treat his patients, see a pretty dramatic uh, effect. And really, I think it was through the AEPPM and his involvement there that, you know, that's a, an organization that, that shares everything. And he was sharing his success uh, with his colleagues. And they're like, well, how do I get some of those? Uh, which is exactly how Langer began when Dr. Langer started making orthotics in his garage, right? How do I get these for my patients? And that led eventually to a product called the More Balance Brace being commercially offered originally through SACEP, ultimately through Arizona AFO. Um, and over the last couple of years that I was at OHI, he had, uh, had some design improvements that he felt were uh, important uh, to, to 
uh, continue the work he'd done uh, previously. Uh, and we just never got it done before uh, I wound up leaving the company. So when I uh, stayed involved with Dr. Moore personally and on a consulting basis and told him that I was thinking about doing a second lab, he goes, how about those design enhancements? So we, we met a bunch of times and we sketched it out and we basically feel like, you know, we've been able to put the 2.0 version of his brace together. It's called the More Balanced Brace Signature Edition. And really the enhancements are, um, they're simple, but they're important. Uh, we, we changed the outer material um, that... Uh, the, the mesh, which was the uh, outer material of the original brace, it had some nice features. It, it was lightweight and it, uh, it was very breathable, but it really frayed uh, fairly easily. Usually he would see patients back in a month or two and the aesthetic of the brace was already compromised. And this is before same and similar. With same and similar now, I mean, these braces really have to last the five years. So we, we decided to go with a, a thin but durable leather uh, outer, uh, and we also have a kid skin inner uh, liner to the brace. So the comfort level, I think, has been enhanced, but the durability greatly enhanced. So that was the first one. The second one was we changed the closure mechanism. Uh, the original brace had two fairly thin uh, Velcro straps. We went with a much broader uh, leather strap with uh, Velcro laminated to the inside of that. And, and the idea here was that people with limited dexterity were really struggling to don and doff the brace uh, in their homes by themselves. And so he wanted to make that process easier. And our new closure system absolutely does that. That's neat. Uh, yeah, yeah, from a, a orthopedic perspective or biomechanical perspective, uh, we stabilize the rear foot even more. The, the shell of the brace has always provided some frontal plane motion, but we've added an external uh, rear foot post that really does add to the stabilization that the uh, brace provides people uh, on the frontal plane. And finally, we, we enhanced our contouring in the longitudinal arch, uh, the original brace. There was uh, no contouring. <laughs> yeah, it was... It was it was fairly uh, flattened and we decided th there's not a really good reason to do that. Um, we don't do that with uh, plantar foot orthosis. There's no reason to do that with a custom AFO. So all of those things combined is really, uh, we think enhanced the brace. Uh, it certainly has made it easier for patients to get it on and off uh, with simplicity. And we think we'll extend the life of the brace uh, significantly with the new materials. Yeah, I think it'll last a lot longer. The, the other ones, they didn't last too, too long. Yeah. Um, patients liked them. They did well. Well, that's great, Jason. I think we covered a, a, a lot of things today. I appreciate your time. If people want to learn more about your, your lab um, and the reason for the, for the, the animal that you have there as the mascot, how can they do that? Yeah. So the animal is a, it's a flamingo and a flamingo is a, actually it's a symbol of balance and grace. Uh, so we we wanted uh, we wanted a, a mascot, if you will, that was uh, cute and fun, and and, uh, and we think the flamingo checked that box, but it also does speak to the, what we try to achieve with our products. Nice. Uh, orthotica.com is our website. My email address is Jason at orthotica.com, mm -hmm. uh, and I would just maybe end with this comment about sort of when we decided to put the lab together. Uh, my partner and I, Peter Karolidis, we knew that the world didn't need another orthotic company. And the only reason why we decided to go forward with it was that we thought there, there's room for improvement. Uh, with today's technologies, today's digital information flow, um, we just thought we could build it from the ground up and, and make things a lot easier, a lot more transparent, uh, make the lab a lot more accountable and really enhance the levels of service uh, that a laboratory should be providing its uh, podiatric clients. So we think we've accomplished that. I think our website does a pretty good job of telling that story. And certainly if uh, there's interest to learn more, there is a calendar invite uh, feature on the website and you could schedule a 15 or 30 minute call and we could tell you the whole orthotica story. That's great. Well, thank you, Jason. I, I, I agree. I think in our lives in general, we always have to be looking how we can improve, right? So whether it be how you do orthotics, how many orthotics, I think we, we don't want to get stagnant. And so it's, it's good when you see in industries and the problem is a lot of times 
when they're big, you can't change them. Kind of like getting little improvements in an AFO or, or anything you want to change, like working for a big hospital group. A lot of us are agile. We're small little offices, so we can change things pretty easy and try new things out. So, yeah. And, and listen, technology is one of the hardest things to change because it's really the foundation of almost every business and anybody that's been through, you know, some of the recent EHR upgrades to cloud-based systems. I mean, it's painful. It's really hard. So labs that have been, you know, built in, and rooted in old technologies, it, it's fairly expensive and fairly cumbersome to try to update that. We had the advantage of uh, imagining this new business in 2021, 2022, uh, we, we, in the middle of the pandemic, frankly, where uh, everything was cloud-based and I think we, we learned how to uh, interact differently and do business differently. And we built all of those efficiencies into our, our foundational structure. So our timing was good. And I think our tools are really designed to make a complicated process, a business process, <clears throat> fairly simple. And I think we're, we're checking that box every day with our clients. Great. Thank you, Jason, for your time. Appreciate it. Welcome. Look forward to the next one.